Hey everyone, in this video I talk with James Hankins. James is a marketing consultant who has coined a couple of very interesting uh, concepts including share of search and the Hankins hexagon. Share of search is a very very interesting uh, methodology to find out where your brand is in terms of market share or at least it's a proxy for it. But it's a, it's a very interesting method to find out more about how you are doing in your category and why and a lot more. So we get into that, we get into the weeds of that and we actually show some examples and some tools of how to do that. And then we also talk about the Hankins hexagon, which is basically an alternative to the traditional um, consumer customer funnel. Uh, or customer journey which is traditionally like the pyramid um, and uh, James has a really interesting take on that that I really appreciate and I think that also fits my whole vision of brand experiences so um, it's a really dense conversation James is a very smart guy so um, I think it's more of like a starting point for you to explore more if you're interested in this sort of stuff um, but yeah enjoy it if you like the video like uh, subscribe all of that stuff and let me know in the comments if you have any questions for me or james enjoy uh i looked at uh byron sharp's uh book brand, um how brands grow and obviously it's in that as well it's like most metrics follow market share um and i i got i got to i got to thinking right okay well this this project with coke i'd shown that brand love and uh google searches um correlated I was like, well, if brand love and Google searches correlate, then um, market share and Google search correlate. Hmm. Uh, so I had a look at those and lo and behold, that, that's what I found is that, that a share of when you manipulate Google searches, the data from Google Trends, like publicly available data, um, you manipulate it in a certain way. Uh, so it turns into a, a share figure um, relative to the competitors in the market. It is uh, a remarkably accurate proxy mm -hmm. um, for for market share. So share of search is a remarkably accurate proxy. Um, now, at the same time, unbeknownst to me, at that exact time anyway, um, but uh, Les Binet was doing some work with Google. Um, and uh, oddly, neither of us published. Um, <laughs> me, because uh, I wasn't allowed um by my various kind of bosses um over the period i'm not really sure why and les um i'm not sure i've had conversations with him but he he didn't publish either um and then uh it got to the summer last year and i'd obviously taken redundancy and i'd been trying to publish it for a while and i had an agreement with wark and completely coincidentally myself and les published our research uh, on in the same week <laughs> in the same week um on share of search now les his background is as an econ in, as an econometrician and in inverted commas the godfather of effectiveness with peter field um i'm a strategist so we came at it from two very different directions my direction is slightly more accessible and very very practical um i've developed upwards of nine ten applications uh for the technique uh in a variety of different guises um les obviously took the more statistically and uh, mathematically robust angle but we came up with the same solutions and the same kind of uh, insights um and i know it sounds a bit odd i suppose it's like well and i know byron sharp has attacked it in one sense um and also uh, kind of Mark Ritson has as well, in the sense that there's other data available that can give you this, right? Mm -hmm. you could, if you if share of share of market equals share of search, well, well it's share of market, and like you can get share of market. Well, not everyone can. Most companies don't have access to market share data. Mm -hmm. um, they, they just don't. Um, and therefore, it, this is a really useful proxy for it it's not one-to-one -one. it never is um very few things are um but the directions and the trajectory um 
the trends and the trajectories, uh, the the relationships and ratios, um, they they stand true remarkably across category, multiple different categories that I've researched uh, and over time. Um, so that's the exciting bit. It gives access to a competitive kind of marketing metric, one of the holy trinity, that kind of profit and, and revenue um, that allows you to say with reasonable confidence, statistical confidence that you are winning, losing or drawing versus your competitors and the category as a whole. Like that's powerful data. Um, yeah. That's what's exciting and anyone can get hold of it. Um, I might be doing myself out of business, but um, anyone can. It's the application and the analysis where um, I suppose I'm able to, because I've done it a lot more, <laughs> able to add a bit more insight uh, and nuance um, to to the debate anyway. Yeah. So that's what you, share of search is. You, you kind of became like the, the SOS guy, right? <laughs> Yeah. in the world pretty 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 much yeah it's it's a it's an interesting position me and les are launching a um a kind of uh search think tank with the ipa sponsored mm -hmm. by the ipa in the next few months um to investigate this area and more um and accelerate the use of search data um within business because it's not just a marketing tool it no. is a whole business metric um and i think some people forget that sometimes they think it's you know just like a communications response but it's not lots of things can affect share of search yeah a lot of things to unpack here i like and and i know personally from a lot of people listening this is one of the biggest struggles is finding out these things like market share because once you get into the idea of the ideas of, of how brands grow and others and, and you subscribe to that to those principles working with smaller brands or not having those budgets it's always like a huge struggle and for me personally like it's still been pretty much impossible to to get that data so so this is like a tool for me that has like this little bit of ah moment to it still <laughs> still have to play around with it but so i, I want to get into some of that but first like did you research the share of search of share of search yet <laughs> Did I research it? Um, the share of search of share of search. Um, <laughs> I actually I did use it in uh, a presentation I did to um, for Marketing Week um, during their recent Effectiveness Week um, conference. And uh, yes, from about um, I think it, uh, Tom Roach borrowed some of Les's work when he published something not long after he took voluntary redundancy back in april may and it began to tick up then and then you got a boost when uh, me and les published in the <laughs> same week and then um subsequently when les and i did our ipa webinar which is still up on the ipa website we did like a two and a half hour webinar on it um it, it started to get a lot bigger um <laughs> so so it's and it's it's continued to grow um yep. and it's continued to grow so yeah it's just uh, still a lot of people aren't aware of it um but uh we're hoping to to kind of change that in the next kind of 12 18 months yeah i'll do my best to to add to that um thank you a couple of questions here first off i think maybe the most important question is maybe the second most important question then like is how do you like in the few steps if i'm like a let's say i own a small to mid-sized brand here and i just want to yep. have a look like where do i start where do you start first place to start is uh google google trends mm -hmm. the the um the, the freely available uh tool um and then it's a question of um identifying your brand for obvious reasons but also who you compete with um yep. now obviously someone like mark ritson will say well it's almost impossible to define um but that's <laughs> the beauty of share of search is that it's all relative within that specific competitor set so mm -hmm. you may lose um 
sales to others outside of your core competitor set and that's fine but when you're identifying share of search um it's it's key to have a, a a reasonable group and it does factor according to size so um and what do i mean by that well let's say john lewis um john lewis competes against the department stores in the uk um but it also competes against amazon now if you pop amazon within that competitor <laughs> set the share of search and share of market still works remarkably accurately like it's a 0.9 uh, r squared i.e the, the model fit of a straight line it it's it's remarkable still within that sector when you drop in amazon so you can create your own groups so once you've got that you you literally pop in um your brand um and then subsequently um the competitors uh brands um there's a few kind of tweaks that you just need to kind of play with which is what are you what are you calling them so you got um is it is it the uh is it the google term that is uh pre-populated so i know tesla here is it the google term that says motor company uh yeah. or is it search term or is it and i typically go with the one that google kind of aggregate against i always do it kind of five uh, well i always roll it on a 12 month basis um and so i often go back as far as i can 2004 but in kind of real terms you can go back five years and you can kind of manually uh, kind of uh, tweak the periods <clears throat> and the data comes in in different packs so it can either come in uh, monthly if you go all the way back to 2004 or it can come in um, uh, week weekly if you go back five years and you just roll it by 52 weeks I keep it to all categories mostly um, because and this is share of search works when you have a strong brand um mm -hmm. it, it it becomes weaker when you when you don't um and then you kind of you pump out that data you download it and then you begin kind of uh manipulating it uh turning turning those uh indices into uh 12 month averages and then turning those 12 month averages into a percentage of the total of the 12 month averages um that that's the I mean, for for more detail, um, if you go to my um, blog, there's there is a blog post that it, that details it, um, which is the EQ Planner um, dot WordPress, um, and that that that's got a blog post um, which uh, details it. Um, if you've got access to Wark, then then there are two papers. There's there's a version of this detail and then there's also a subsequent one where i go into um uh, more of the techniques that i've developed mm -hmm. um the ipa have the webinar which is me talking for about 45 minutes to an hour on some of the techniques and the ways of doing this um, and then i think marketing week and dmx um dublin have also got videos um which talk around this area or I'm for hire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, cool. I'll I'll, I'll put up up those links uh, in the show notes for people wanting to learn more. Because again, yeah, we're not. This is not a tutorial for uh, share of search per se. Um, but maybe just a, a couple of more like questions um, going beyond it. One of the things yep. I I've noticed, like even just when we were talking before the conversation started, when I Google, for example, your name, this famous historian comes up um like how do you deal with maybe brand names that are a little bit more ambiguous so there's two there's two ways there are there are companies out there that are beginning to um commercialize uh share of search and produce uh kind of um things that sit over the top and they what they do uh one is called uh one of the companies is called gravis um based out mm -hmm. in sweden um and they've got a telescope tool that that, that grabs this uh gravis labs um mm -hmm. and uh they look for keyword strings that most accurately um correlate with um market market share so um 
that gets around the issue whereby you have they're almost looking for data that is representative of market share mm-hmm. um, rather than the pure share of search. So that's, that's yeah. one way of getting around it. Another way is just acknowledging that actually, you know what? Um, I think we one of the companies I've worked with is, is a house of brands rather than a branded house. Um, so they've got a number of different kind of uh, uh, a product brands they're not like i uh, say a cadbury's who have kind of shifted to cadbury's dairy milk dairy milk with caramel dairy milk with nuts etc mm-hmm. etc cetera, et cetera. um and uh because of that they've got some they've got some weird weird brands that that mean other things so start hmm. uh and a, a great one is um i think there's a a, a I think it's the same cereal, but it's called Start in the UK and Fitness in France or something mm-hmm. like that. Right. They, they aren't terms, branded terms that uh, you can you can use for something like this. Um, what you can do is, is shift the filter from um, all categories to, I don't know, um, breakfast or food. Yeah. And that filters out some. And then in others, if you haven't, then 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 you can't use it unfortunately that this isn't a perfect um metric so there's there's three options one is to utilize a a a tool like gravis telescope um another is to um, kind of try and find out what a key keyword string could be and the other is kind of just edit it out and that's not ideal but you've got a brand that is I'd argue isn't particularly strong um, yeah. or, or, or or unique. It might work in that at that category. There might be a whole um, category entry point kind of factor to it mm-hmm. when you go yeah. to buy when you go to buy cereal. You think start cereal or fitness cereal or whatever. Um, there might be that, but but it's not transitory uh, not transitory it doesn't transcend the category outside that because it means so many different things um and we're finding stuff that's that's the beauty of this this technique is that you kind of need to play with it a bit mm-hmm. and you do need to validate i i hammer it every single time i don't when i use it i validate it every single time and by that i mean i go and try and find market share data yeah. or something that represents market share data um i'm not sure if it's the same in holland but we have uh, in the uk and and ireland or they have to pay for it in ireland we have access to company reports um mm-hmm. of, yeah um all private companies so you go to company's house and uh you download their most recent filed reports and you'll get a revenue figure yep. um, for that business, and and quite often I use that. Um, or there's there's public companies, obviously they they publish theirs uh, freely available, so I use their data. Um, I'm working for a company in the US, and uh, they they have they're an industry based, so uh, they work in education. So there's education databases collated by the government. I use that data like. Mm-hmm. It, to validate yeah. it forces you into doing this really interesting kind of diagnosis um and an investigation of a company um and and you learn more through doing that so validating yeah. it is is so important um you can do that if you're a small company as well or if you're a local company they will have accounts that they have to file um so yeah it's it's you you do it all together it's not a silver bullet um but it will lead you to some fascinating insights um and supportive data for your hypotheses um it really will yeah and and funnily enough like when we were talking about brand names it's actually a great argument to to invest in having like a, a proper brand name that is ownable and defendable and and like even on a more international scale thinking about how it will scale beyond your your local region it's like it ties in nicely with that because i talk about that a lot with clients and it this is like a a, an argument for it so i thank you for that (laughs) yeah uh uh, maybe the the next important question to ask here is okay so we we have this id we've overlaid some other data we've validated some other data and we have a good idea of what our 
share share search is and what the competition yep. is like now now what do we do with it what what, what can you, we learn like, from it <laughs> <laughs> um so what can you i mean you, you you learn relative position and uh trajectory mm -hmm. so uh, i mean <clears throat> an interesting one here um is obviously tesla looks as though it's what, twice the size of uh volkswagen um that's musk uh, <laughs> pardon that's yes, probably exactly <laughs> It's, it's it's so um and we know that that um uh, tesla sell about half a million cars um at the moment uh globally um mm -hmm. volkswagen probably do kind of um 10 times plus that yeah. um so um what what what's this telling us well this tells us that share of search for um tesla is disproportionate to um kind of its actual share of market um and what does that tell us well it tells us to look into how it's beginning to to generate that and as you as you said it's it's kind of their their chief ex, chief exec elon um who is bonused um on uh kind of pumping the stock Yes, he has to. His 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 um, kind of incentives to earn money are linked to Tesla thresholds of production and also stock price. Um, and they aren't they are linked, but they aren't always kind of a strong link. And so he mm -hmm. pumps. He's a one man PR machine. Uh, everyone <laughs> says that Tesla don't market. They don't do mm -hmm. marketing. Yes, they do. He's going to cost them if he hits all those thresholds, fifty-five billion dollars. Um, that's the incentive at play here. That is probably the largest marketing budget in the world, fifty-five <laughs> billion dollars. Um, and that's what's happening here: is that he's uh, disproportionately pumping share of search um, up above what you'd expect it to be relative to its its sales. Um, that's that's not surprising i suppose that but it it allows you to explain um kind of why these relationships or why why this differs um what you can also do what i've developed recently is a factoring um amount because there are companies out there that have strong house brands um but then they make money in different ways beneath that um mm -hmm. so what what we've what we've learned is that um quite often um the the share of search uh, metric uh that that google google trends index is representative of the kind of interest in the whole umbrella business if you multiply that or you factor it down by the proportion of uh revenue that is driven by the different business units within that umbrella mm -hmm. so say you earn i don't know 50 percent of your revenue from uh, a SaaS product versus 50 yep. percent from a payments product um you factor your share of search by 50 so you multiply it by 0.5 um that has that works <laughs> that that brings it that brings it down so it has share of search is related to typically value um market share um it's it's revenue market share versus your competitors now obviously you have to turn revenue into profit so there are other things you will need to analyze um and it's not always value market share you have to know the category if you're working in education then then it's probably volume because it's the number of students that are going through. So this is the part about validation, understanding the dynamics of the category and share of search mm -hmm. forces you to do that, to explain the relationships. Um, and then I suppose you've got it over time. You've got it trended. You've got 15 years worth of data, longitudinal data that's consistent um, and comparative. And, and you can do multiple different things uh, with that Um over time, you can look at growth. You can look at change over time um, using cumulative. So you can draw S curves. You can uh, compare it against investment levels. So you can go your, your classic share of share of voice versus share of search, and your Jones model extra share of voice versus share of search, and the Hankins kind of uh, me matrix, um, a quadrant piece of quadrant analysis, which is extra share of search versus 
growth annual growth in in uh, extra share of voice versus annual growth in share of search so you have positive and negative positive and negative and you can plot your brands on that against each other and you get a map of the category around how they're using advertising in one sense to grow and investment in marketing in one sense to grow but if they aren't then how are they growing and this is where it becomes a business diagnostic because it may be that they're growing through a sales team or it may, mm -hmm. may be that their product is is slightly different or their price is lower and therefore they're able to get away with spending less in marketing because they've got another growth lever or um, less in advertising because they've got another growth lever and that's where it becomes very very powerful because you're taking a, um, a C-suite level metric market share and you're analyzing it against potential growth levers and you're painting a picture of how the category works and the c-suite love this sort of thing because they can see trajectory and they can see movement and they can see whether things are working um and it gives you a leaping off point for further investigation so if if a competitor's sales team are working really hard and effectively and driving more sales um then then can you copy that are they likely to reach a threshold because after a while the reach of those sales teams is going to diminish the incentives of those sales teams or what are they doing how are they incentivizing to grow that product set versus other product sets it becomes a very very powerful business diagnostic if you if you don't use it just in a pure sense like if you if you use it as a leaping off point um, and that's a lot of what i've been doing for for my clients is setting this all up helping them read the category dynamics and demonstrating that you know brand a is doing this brand b is doing this and look there's an opportunity here no one's utilizing the the value of advertising effectively they're all using sales teams your sales team isn't that good that's why you're losing therefore you may as well pile in for advertising that will also support your sales team because suddenly your sales team will be able to go in and point at look we've spent 10 million pounds on advertising aren't we big aren't we great aren't we strong <laughs> like this is where it becomes very very interesting yeah and and i guess like there there's also some some like pitfalls to it is like one one thing i can imagine people doing when they read it read into this is making the goal share of search like and then just investing in i don't know search engine advertising and just saying like look guys we're, we're the best search results search results ever well this this is the interesting bit is that um there are ways of gaming it but they they are fraudulent like mm -hmm. genuinely legally fraudulent because you would have to pay for um bots or human beings to repeatedly search your brand home. yeah um and people have done that um <laughs> i think actually companies have done that to game their own search numbers because they were bonused on them um but mm -hmm. uh, that's that's how you would do it it's an out show of search is an output um whereas um kind of something like getting the bots running or getting um paying for ppc seo their inputs yeah. um this, this is almost a a pure um metric for intent um in, in yeah, your and brand that's a really interesting point because i i was thinking when i first read about this i was thinking like i i'm never gonna google uh, my soap brand or my whatever brand i don't know like but then again, if it's all that for all of the category, then probably the data is still relevant, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. People, people search for soap and FMCG products, and it's remarkably accurate. Um, remarkably, you'd be you'd be surprised. Um, there are some businesses where they have so few searches um that they don't kind of come through and they have but they have market share mm -hmm. that's your classic physical availability is driving that like literally they're available in in store um and there's a wonderful economic law called says law which is supply creates its own demand and mm -hmm. merely by uh, supplying it and being in store you are generating demand now mm -hmm. the retailers buyers probably won't like you 
um, but <laughs> consumers will pick your product up. Um, and that's that's what we see is that some some brands um, share of search is is, is zero, um, uh, but they still have market share. Um, others, the share of search is, is greater than zero, but they've got barely any market share. Um, people know about them, but aren't um, kind of seemingly buying them. And there's a problem there. Like there's a conversion problem there. Um, yeah. I.e., People can't get your product for whatever reason. Yeah, it, it seems like like a, such a just like the, the one of the best starting points for any type of strategy where it's just like it's getting a, a feel for what what is happening and then you can basically jump off into a lot of directions but that's what i really like about this type of research it's like very open for interpretation and insights and what you do with it but it's still like the perfect way to just get started on if you're helping a brand doing anything which i think is very interesting um one other big topic we want to of course tackle is um the hankins hexagon sounds amazing <laughs> <laughs> but but maybe maybe just start by saying like why for heaven's sake uh james did you need to create another type of funnel what's wrong what's wrong with the original <laughs> one why <laughs> why why what does i well, I wasn't working, was I? Um, so I had lots of time on my hands um, <laughs> alongside uh, alongside looking after three uh, three kids under seven. Um, so yes, so the Hankins Hexagon. So this is uh, I published this in Marketing Week. Um, when was it actually? It mu it must have been February. I have a date uh, here. So yeah, you have a second of February. Second of Feb. So. I was very fortunate. I was uh, named a change maker of uh, Marketing Week change maker of 2000, uh, 2020. Um, and I'd been in conversations with um, kind of uh, Marketing Week about I've got this really neat model that I've been working on. Um, so what's probably worthwhile is for, for your listeners is there's a blog post, I think, from March last year. Um, <clears throat> where I'd aggregated a lot of my thinking on funnels and, and paths to purchase. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd gone through a history of um, them, basically, and gone, well, this is the IDA model. This is the IDA evolutionary model. This is the McKinsey loop. This is the Accenture X. Um, and gone through and gone, right, the reason why this doesn't work is because of. The reason why this doesn't work of is X. So the funnels, is, and, and then Mark Ritson wrote about funnels back in September, I think. Yeah. And then Google also did the messy middle kind of in August time. That was the um, funnel, the funnel juggling thing that yes. Ritson wrote, right? Ritson, Mark, Mark <laughs> I, I just wrote like the funnel. the sound of it, juggling funnels. <laughs> <laughs> he was juggling, he was juggling funnels, um, which is basically it depends. You got to do your own stuff, um, yeah. and the messy middle. Google spent two years and I don't know how many thousands of pounds um, <laughs> to get to the conclusion, which was uh, yeah, it's messy. Um, <laughs> And it really annoyed me. I'd done this history and, and, and I'd pointed out the major issues. And I'd also uh, gone, right, I think of the funnel as a number of independent steps that some of them are fixed, but most of them aren't. Mm -hmm. um, like, and, and, and then I'd gone, hang on a bit. This, my evolution is I did these, these uh, pentagram sketches uh, is one of my my co common doodles is a pentagram and you kind of you can draw a pentagram without taking your pen off the um, paper and I got to thinking well hang on a bit right this seems more like how people go through the path to purchase um, they they just bounce around and they can come in whenever they want and they're, they're kind of all, always within that shape um, bouncing around between it um, and I compared that against my uh, disassociated stages um, and thought, hang on, I need six. So <laughs> that's where the hexagon came from is um, six uh, almost standardized points connected um, to every other point um, so that you so that the consumer can go wherever they want they can go backwards they can go forwards they can go in uh, they can go in circles um <laughs> and uh since then I've, I've i've found out that that there is a mathematical principle that that supports this i always knew there was but i've been given the name um they're called markov 
somethings. Um, <laughs> essentially, they the, the the principle is that that the value um, between of a line in probability terms is fixed. Uh, so <clears throat> if you're going from got this this uh wonderful picture that that dan white has has done um dan has published a book on um kind of uh, marketing models and, and metaphors it's very very good and he approached me and said look i think i can improve this and so he has um and we're working together on a couple of papers coming up um but this is what it looks like so you you can literally start anywhere on here and and we talked about in the paper we talked about a new metaphor which is pinball and pinball is about trajectory and also probability and so hmm. it, it fits you can pinball around this and go in any single kind of route or path um i suppose the interesting output is that most people will find a common path for categories so here's where it aligns with Ritson's juggling is that categories will have different normal distribution pathways so most people will go from, I don't know, uh, no need to current buy, which is kind of out of market, which is the majority of people, the majority of the time. So they'll be out of market and they might receive a trigger. So the majority of people might receive a trigger and then they'll go, I don't know, compare potential contenders you've got here. Long list is what I used to call it. Uh, then then you might go narrow down and shortlist, explore the pot possibilities you might experience the product you might go for a test drive and then you make make a purchase or you might just go and make a purchase and drop back down so there's multiple different ways that are, that are kind of relevant and you can bounce around these but there will be common pathways and and where the probabilities are more likely and the probability bit is important because marketing is all about increasing the likelihood i.e the probability that someone will choose you um mm -hmm. when they're buying um and this allows you to map the um, aggregate pro probabilities for purchase pathways and then layer over your channels that help deliver those pathways and you can tweak and test and improve the probability that someone is moving through um it also stops you wasting money on investing in uh, stuff that won't make a difference. Because if your path to purchase is not within, or one of those nodes is what I call them, if your node explore possibilities isn't within the normal distribution of your category's path to purchase, then you can either say, well, that's not going to make any difference. I Why would I waste my marketing cash on improving that? Mm -hmm. Or, or always all um you could say well actually there's a competitive advantage to be had by boosting that up and getting people over to us in that explore the possibilities and that might allow us to short circuit and improve the probability here but it allows you to test and learn like that's what this is about so whereas funnels are conceptually a useful metaphor people trip over themselves because they go well it's about conversion right i'll stick people in the top and if i've got 90 percent awareness and i convert 50 percent of those to consideration then 20 percent will go through into um intent to buy and then three percent will go through to loyal like yeah. the use of the word conversion suggests that it is a linear pathway this tries to take marketers away from linear and go it's it's chaotic yeah it, well not chaotic it's, it's messy complex, it's messy <laughs> it's complicated i got very very frustrated with the messy middle and i was like no this is what the mess looks like it looks like this um and I have t spoken to, to uh, Google about um, whether the, the, their next iteration, we can work together on something because I think this is a lot more useful than it's messy. Everyone knows it's messy. This provides <laughs> some intellectual, an intellectual framework that, that brings to light that mess. Um, and Dan and I are, are working on a few other things um, to, to actually make this more practical um, to, to marketers. Um, he's already, made the um the labels or the nodes um a bit easier to understand my um my labels are a bit esoteric <laughs> yeah no but i i think what's what's really interesting to me about this model is 
that it's not like it at first I was looking at it and I was thinking like okay so we need to improve on all the all the notes but it's really about like finding out how the average behavior of a category is and then looking at what how your brand fits into that and maybe how it can also differentiate I think like that's probably something where my biggest question is, is like how do you know when there's an opportunity to let's say let's say it's a i don't know soap brand to stick there and people just go from from no current need to buy to maybe i don't know experiencing the product and then making the purchase and maybe you yeah. have this idea okay we need to explore possibilities like how how do we find the material to do that and and a side question sorry for making it even more elaborate is like how do you even figure out just the standard behavior in a category for, in the first place? Yeah, uh, I mean that's that's uh, that's research. That's yeah, yeah. We kind of. I mean that's what we're working on. Uh, Dan and I are working on at the moment is what are the metrics that you kind of use uh, to represent these, and are they simple metrics that people are already tracking, or are they new metrics that people need to track? Um, I think they're a combination. I mean, no need, no no current need to buy. Um, arguably is is close to an awareness sort yeah. of sort of measure um mm. receive receive trigger well that is a combination of um marketing triggers obviously but also need so um you could uh you could go in you could have a baby right let's let's talk about um kind of buying um baby gear because we've both yeah. had to do that in the last <laughs> kind of two years um and uh so no no current need to buy suddenly your wife's pregnant and yeah that's the trigger right yeah. it trips you over well how many people get pregnant every year in the uk like how many babies are born Three hundred thousand yeah. or something like that right so <clears throat> you've gone from people who are aware uh, of my of my service i'm i'm i don't know mother care john lewis do amazing kind of baby stuff mm -hmm. um do they know that i i make that so it's got to be a specific sort of product led awareness okay well what about the total number of people that are that are in the market that are receiving that at any one time okay it's, it's this so you've got a conversion from aware that i through to kind of receiving that trigger you've got a probability that you can calculate do people then actually long list me well is it a consideration measure i don't know but you can see how you can begin to filter out or filter over potential metrics and work out the probabilities between them um that's the challenge for me and dan is that obviously one way it works um, but what happens if you kind of go back so it's not very good in uh, pregnancy because how are you going to go back on that? Um, <laughs> but but it might be that you, you you go backwards and forwards when you're looking at a car between a long list yeah. and a short list. Like you don't just go, I've got a long list and then I've looked at the short list and then I go on. You might go back and relook at the long list. And because these Markov chains, that's the, the probability model, are fixed to a degree, like that's that's once we've identified those like you can you can work back from that um so yeah that's the that's the big challenge at the moment is is turning into that i know lots of people have conceptually begun using this just to begin to map it out in their brains yeah. rather than using the the ultimate outcome which is these probabilities and you know that's fine too that the whole point is to try and get people out of this horrible funnel which is just <laughs> about we, I think you had, uh, oh, who was it you had on this previously, like a week or so ago? Um, uh, Samuel, really? Sam, yes. Yeah. Sam, um, so we were chatting about funnels the other week um, on, a, on another podcast. And um, our frustration, both Sam's and I, were the, the, the literal use of funnels, the literal use, i.e. the conversion bits, rather than, a metaphor and, and mapping mm -hmm. stuff um so that it, it helps bring it together in your mind um and that's that's where this comes in this can be used both for that mapping but it can work at a literal level as well um, yeah. and that's why ultimately i felt that this was a step on from 
what we've seen over the last 110 years <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I think it's such a like smart way to to visualize, and I think like populating it with data and making sure you understand it is even in if it's just like the the effort is probably such a like very valuable exercise, and it, and it reminded me of like a, there's a I don't know if you know this brand called Cowboy the the electrical bikes. Uh, no, no, they they did like this interesting thing where most people buy electrical bikes by rather well going online and probably doing yeah. the comparing and then or going to a store but they they have like this thing on their website and everywhere you go where you can they come to you with the bike and you can experience the product and it's yeah. like such a different way of looking at it i think it's also very it's it's probably a very costly way to do it but it it is something like a completely different path and it has i think given them maybe a little bit of an interesting advantage but th that's something that r immediately my mind goes to when i see this it's like it also also gives you like new opportunities of thinking and optimizing or just changing it completely yeah i mean the dash buttons then they, they no longer exist um, amazon's dash buttons but mm -hmm. uh they 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 completely circumvent most of the steps in this because they go no need to current buy yeah. make purchase like that's the ultimate <laughs> goal right <laughs> it's yeah like there's there's nothing in between and you and you do get that in other categories like when you're shopping and you you can't do it in the uk now because they ban chocolates from the um when with the, the the checkouts but that's literally what that is right you walk up yeah and oh i'm gonna buy a mars bar right well no need to current buy to make purchase within the space of three steps like that that that's where that comes these are all opportunities uh, for people to think think differently and and your point there about the cowboy bikes um is is the one about direct response and advertising mm -hmm. because direct response gets you to experience the product almost immediately right you buy the product you experience it and there is nothing stronger in a kind of branding uh, perspective than experiencing the product like that is the ultimate right yeah. it's not about advertising advertising has an effect but it's a, a weak effect actually experiencing the product is a lot stronger which is why i mean in motor um it's, it's all about test drives and getting people out but uh yeah it's it if you can if you can engineer that and that that's where experience came from right you yeah. you are creating a branded experience to get people closer to the product i think a lot of people forgot that you're supposed to be getting them closer to the product um <laughs> somehow and have done it close to the brand but you know as long as the brand represents the product then that's fine um but yeah that's a really big thing and people forget that when it comes to direct response and they talk about branding versus sales activation and, and they go oh well brand is all about the brand well yeah so sales activation it's about products consumption that is the ultimate branded experience like, yeah yeah <laughs> no but i mean that this is like amen because <laughs> no really like i i have these discussions a lot i see these discussions a lot about branding versus marketing which is even even more ridiculous to, to call it that but like f focusing away from all of those like long term short term whatever it is but looking at this thing makes it like it's really about that path to purchase and how they get there and how you make sure that happens and branding or experience or whatever you use is a way to get there and and it also like doesn't focus on the fact that it's for example purely digital or purely physical because that's also like one of those big uh, barriers a lot of people put which is interesting to me to to look at it that way and maybe in in that context one like last question before we wrap it up you you also yeah. do talk a lot about digital availability and as you might know i'm a big fan of of byron sharp's mental physical availability i'm really yeah. fascinated by it like could you elaborate a little bit on that yeah so um another another concept it's big 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 year um so <laughs> and this this one is a bit more controversial i suppose because there's a lot of debate around i know do we need to use the word digital um it means it, it it's a blanket word like strategy um yeah. can mean multiple different things to many many people um and i i stand my ground on this one if you say to a non-marketeer physical availability they will think about physical tangible things 
They yeah. will think about stores. They will think yep. about bricks. They will think that's how they will think because it's jargon. It's jargon. Mm -hmm. Like as wonderful as the Ehrenberg Institute is, um, that is jargon. And so if we're in marketing, we're about clarity and, and, and understanding things and making it easier for consumers to buy our stuff. Well, who's consuming it here is the CFO and the, and the chief exec, right? Yeah. So the idea is that you have a uh, you have three levers to grow businesses you have mental availability which is the um uh, the me mem memorable links at point of purchase so you someone thinks of your brand when they're about to buy essentially yeah um then you have physical availability now if you look at the definition it is perfect, but people don't get that far because to <laughs> understand the definition, you've got to read the book. Uh, I know very few people have read the book, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so it's about being able to buy the product in as many physical spaces as you can. Physical availability. Mm -hmm. So you're in all the multiples. You're in the corner shops. You're in uh, the specialist shops. You're in the wholesale. Like be available so that people can buy your product whenever they need. Okay. That's in the physical world because that's physical availability. Digital availability is just applying exactly the same concept to the digital realm. So it's going, right, okay, what are digital availability channels? Well, they are the e-commerce platforms. So you're, you're kind of um, – your Ebays and your, your Amazons. Yeah. Um, are you available to buy on those? Are you merchandised? Are you available on the specialist sites? So I buy a lot of um, of, of American whiskey. So yep. Master of Malt is one of the kind of platforms that I use. Is your whiskey available on that? Um, is it available in PPC? And this is controversial. And I know Grace Kite has also talked about it, um, but I have a slightly different take on it to her signage view um which is taken from benedict evans who's an analyst but beside the point um <laughs> so google search ppc right think of it like this think of it like uh what's the biggest uh, supermarket in holland uh i'm from belgium by the way but right, so uh, it's probably gonna be the the laser it's uh, the the lion the laser. Thing. yeah the lion right yeah so you you're stocked in the lion the laser right mm -hmm. <clears throat> you're on shelf mm -hmm. google is essentially a digital shelf and yep. that's all you're doing google is equivalent of the laser and you are stocking your product within their digital <laughs> shelf and there's loads of other stuff out the back and e-commerce is a fantastically complicated uh fulfillment engine and and actually me and jp castlin are writing uh, a treaties is the ultimate thing on this whole thing out the back that marketers don't consider and the implications of not considering that. But that's essentially what Google is. It is a digital shop that you stock your stuff in. PPC is like that. Shopping, their shopping kind of options are the same thing. Um, it is just stocking like Deliza in their shop. So that's digital availability. And there's loads of other affiliates using other people to yeah. sell your stuff. Well, that's just digital availability. Like it is, your your product is more available to 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 be bought. Um, and this this kind of comes into a bit of a challenge here with something like a Nike or an Adidas who are currently pulling back from using a lot of digital retailers and and physical retailers as well. They're they're making a strategic gamble um, that uh, they're dig by dialing back their digital and physical availability and we know that maximizing those is is an opportunity to grow and they're taking it as much as possible adidas want 50 percent of their stuff coming in-house <clears throat> now that's a choice right that's a strategic choice but the implications are well you have to deal with your whole fulfillment engine someone like you are not an expert in that and it will cost you more money to do that versus someone else doing it um, I allowing Tesco's to do fulfillment or allowing um, kind of uh, Amazon to do fulfillment. So you begin to see how digital availability by calling it out and allowing uh, non-marketeers to understand that they are different levers and they respond to different ways of growing helps you make better decisions at a strategic mm -hmm. level.
that that's what it's ultimately about and and lots of kind of our industry have said oh we don't need another digital label yeah but it's not for us and if you apply <laughs> if you apply byron sharp's kind of um kind of uh you know um uh, what's the, uh, the 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 few you can't grow a brand with just a few kind of fans mm -hmm. you need the long tail to grow yeah well you can't grow uh, understanding by just relying on a few kind of people like us Steph, who who are deep in it like you've got to talk to the rest and therefore clarity of language matters absolutely um, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to extend the concepts of availability by try just breaking them apart a bit um, to allow other non-marketers to understand. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's uh, it's it, yeah, it's a very interesting one. I I'm fascinated because of where it leads ultimately as a strategic mm -hmm. choice mechanism um but i know a lot of um our industry get frustrated with the use of the word digital but um like we gotta swallow it sometimes you know yeah like we gotta we gotta practice what we preach right the, yeah <laughs> it's yeah, interesting exactly. you mentioned that okay um i think i could probably pick your brain for a few more days but um, we're gonna wrap it up here this was already pretty dense and a lot of really interesting stuff to unpack uh, for the people that want to get to know you learn more follow you where can they reach out reach out yep so i am at jcp hankins on twitter that's where i i spend more of my time um the eq planner um there's a load of stuff on there that's dot wordpress.com yep. Um, I'm on LinkedIn under James Hankins, um, and uh, I think that's it from my socials. At some point, I'll get around to making myself a website. Um, <laughs> at some point, um, but yeah, that's that's where I'm at, and uh, and I, I I pop up. I've started to pop up at various different kind of conferences and stuff like that, talking as well. Awesome! Thank you so much for this, James. It was cool. That's right. My pleasure. <laughs>